Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pixel Cast. I am Jeremy Lessie, founder of Pixel Fest, and tonight I am joined by Jasmine Green. She is an indie developer from New York City. How's it going tonight, Jasmine? It's going well. Awesome. I'm so glad that you're on the show. This is really cool because Jasmine's the first developer that sort of reached out and wasn't from Hampton Roads. I, I don't know Jasmine. Uh-huh. I've never met her before, although we both know Tony Powell because Tony is, like I said, iconic on the East Coast. Yeah. It's a social butterfly. He really he really <laughs> is. And Jasmine and I agree that Tony is the community builder at all these cons up and down, whether he's in New York, whether he's in Norfolk, whether he's in D.C., it doesn't matter. He's always building that community. Um, but apparently, I guess a couple of months ago, I put out a, a post in Indie Game dev chat, indie game chat, and I think I was looking for people to interview when I was down in Florida. So I was on a trip and I was asking if anybody was down in the in the Keys. And so I guess that that post, you know, somehow that came across Jasmine's desk and she sent me a, a private message and said, hey, I'd love to be on the Pixelcast. And I was like, cool, somebody from New York City wants to be on the Pixelcast. So she is here with us tonight. And as you can see in the background, we have uh, their logo. Luminosity is the name of her indie game studio, which she co-founded in 2015. And the game in the background is The Painter's Apprentice. And in the upper right corner, you'll see a game called Tortuga Racing, which you can get on iOS and Android, I think, right now. I picked it up, actually super fun game, where you can practice your math skills. It'll take you back to like fifth grade, where you had to do those hundred math problems as fast as you could. (laughs) So what you do is you see the math problem, two plus nine, and then you have to quickly tap on that sort of D-pad slash steering wheel, answer the problem as quick as you can, and then when you answer enough of them, in succession, you will be able to then hit uh, the turbo button and, and get a boost. Of course, if you answer it wrong, you'll spin out. So really cool game. So Jasmine, uh, can you tell tell us? My since I don't know you, I feel like the all these games and you've got a couple more coming uh, have like a real like an educational slant, and they are very I feel like enlightening is is the way I would describe my experience thus far. Yeah. So you know we didn't necessarily uh, go like start off with like we're going to make educational games our first game actually um, was called Once Upon a Runner it's act- we actually took it down from iOS and Android because we're remastering it so that's a just a straightforward 2D runner um, we initially made it with our previous company um, called Salty Pepper and that was run by someone else so that was made because we were kind of trying to advertise another game that we were creating um, so we're like hey you know why don't we make something that's going to be short and fun and introduce one of the characters and introduce the world so it's kind of where Once Upon a Runner came about but unfortunately that studio folded I was able to get the IP rights for Once Upon a Runner and we'd been working on it for a while at the time so we're like alright we we got to finish the game, <laughs> we'll release it. And then from there, we um, we got into some other games that didn't quite pan out. And then, um, you know, I for The Painter's Apprentice, I kind of have a lot of artist friends. I thought it was kind of an interesting concept to travel through different art styles. Um, and I, I, at the time, I hadn't really seen anything that was doing that. During the process of development, eventually I started seeing more games that kind of touched upon the aspects. We were kind of traveling through the, um, you know, famous paintings. And now there's these cool, like, AR things where you can travel through, like, Monet's Garden and other things, which is really awesome. But at the time, there was nothing like it, so I thought it would be kind of fun. Um, I wanted to do kind of a simple game like a platformer just because you know there wouldn't be too many mechanics but we could make it kind of interesting um and then it just kind of evolved into more of this um educational aspect where it's like all right well now you know what would be the collectibles in a game about art well you would obviously be collecting paintings um and then we kind of came up with this encyclopedia idea where you could learn more about the paintings and the artists and the art styles um, and then from there, uh, we had Tortuga Racing, which actually was for a contest. Oh, I didn't um, know that. To, that's cool. Yeah, to create an educational <laughs> game. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where that came about. But um, the contest kind of fell through, so we ended up keeping it. And we're like, yeah, I mean, it's a good game. We might as well publish it. Um, so yeah. it's you know, obviously been uh, pretty popular with parents. Um, I see big and, promise in the game, and I have to, yeah. I have to give you. I, maybe you all have thought about this. I'm not sure, but I have to give you my what I wanted to do as soon as I was yeah. playing it. 
Um, yeah. You you want to what you want to hear that right now? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I was like going to save that for later. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't want to in interrupt the whole story about it. Um, so the big thing that I saw as I'm playing Tortuga racing, and I went back to check to see if it was there because I was like, oh, maybe maybe it was maybe it was there already. But it seems to me that this game could be like an in school like scholastic esport or something like that where the students are all controlling turtles multiplayer and the thing is broadcast on an apple tv or something like that and then the students are then answering math problems on their phone and then the tur you know there's like a big spectator view of the turtles racing you know up top and i don't know something where it's um networked multiplayer with a spectator camera you know you know people like to watch spelling spelling bees and things like that those are actually sort of like spectator educational sports so that was the vibe that i was getting off of this game love playing it just by myself because i i did like to do those math problems really fast when i was a kid but um yeah for some reason that's what came across in my mind i don't know if that's something that had ever no, crossed y'all's minds or not something that we were thinking about we actually it's interesting because we were um you know a lot of the cons that we go to you know, we go to Pack South or Magfest or you know, Awesome Con. Actually, Awesome Con would be a, uh, a good one mm -hmm. when it comes up. But most of the ones we go to are very focused on gaming, um, mostly adults. Um, so it's kind of you know, Tortuga racing isn't necessarily something that is easy to show off there. But recently, I went to um, I showed off our new game Osunia which is a farm life sim game um, at something called uh, Mind Fair which was in Queens mm. and that was as you might expect just like a huge family event lots of kids um, who are in the age range that Tortuga Racing would be good for right. so um, you know Osunia for them was great because they're like oh Mind Fair or Minecraft this kind of looks like Minecraft because it's kind of low poly and stuff yeah and open world and things like that for Osunia so um but you know we had actually we had a pretty good crowd so for the for the other kids what we do like hey you want to play like a racing game <laughs> and so we would give them Tortuga Racing um some kids were a lot more comfortable with it than others um the parents really liked it you know it was an educational game and then yes you know some some of them were uh, there were siblings who would kind of compete against each other mm -hmm. so it's definitely something that Maybe not this Tortuga Racing, maybe another Tortuga Racing, because I, I'm not exactly sure how the multiplayer aspect would work, or putting it in, you know, if we put sure. it in, all of a sudden, like, how much reworking of the actual base game it would take. Um, but I do like that idea where you could actually, like, you know, compete with each other, you could see each other's scores, um, and uh, I didn't even think about the actual, like... Um, spectator view which is interesting that yeah that, that would that, that would really get everybody else into a cheering you know what i mean sure. so I'm, I'm a big spectator camera person i i love um the idea i've always thought about esports way before i feel like they were even a thing um one year this, uh, this is just so embarrassing but just for like one of my birthdays i had made a game way back in the day called aerial antics it was like the first game that i'd ever gotten published garage games published it back in the day and I had a multiplayer version of it that I made that I think I ended up releasing it as a secret like way down the line um, if you like unlocked everything in the full game but uh, basically it was jetpack soccer and so you're flying on these jetpacks kind of like the original pilot wings if you haven't played that um, you know or pilot wing 64 I don't know if you played that game but it had a mechanic very similar to that uh, but then I threw a soccer ball in and had a four player like jetpack soccer thing going yeah. And so I had it set up so my buddies and I could play it, and then uh, you know none of our none of our significant others were really into video games. So I thought, well, what I could do is set up a spectator camera so that they can just hang out and they could watch us play. Yeah. And and so I put a um, you know I set up a, another external screen, and the way that I did it, I didn't even network the camera. I just hooked it up to the most powerful computer, and then I did a dual render. So the left side of the screen. You know, basically, I rendered the game view, and then the right side of the screen, I rendered the spectator camera. But that ended up rendering on the other TV. I think I just used like Windows the the stretching capability to put it over there. But it, it um that was the first time I think I ever did one, and it was neat. You know, as the, the as the players would converge on the ball, the camera would zoom in. Then when the players would get far away from the ball, it'd zoom out. So it had like this sort of panning effect and everything like that. 
and um, I think I've been obsessed with the the idea ever ever since then. And that was I probably that was probably like two thousand two thousand five, I think, or something like that. Um, and we had a spectator camera in Swapfire that that uh, you could use the Wii U gamepad for, and I think I did it in a few other games, but. You know, I, I just love that idea of bringing the crowd into the game, yeah. I guess, you know, and, and I was playing this and it just hit me. I could just see a whole, you know, classroom of kids. Whole classroom. Yes. Putting, putting the pressure on exactly, the Exactly, like cheering them on, like, get them. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the kids up front answering those math problems as fast as they can. <laughs> So I I don't know that was the vibe that I got that was um, yeah I mean I definitely like that idea um I'll probably maybe I'll steal it for the next one you got it yeah <laughs> just go for it I think it would be sweet um, um, but what we are going to be doing though is we're actually working on updating it so right now we're just kind of updating some of the basic stuff um some of the bugs that we have um but we're also going to be adding some more back end things so more for like teachers and parents oh nice. Um, so, so kind of looking at the stats for, you know, when the kids do it, you can see, like, how many questions have they gotten wrong? What is, like, the number one question that they're usually getting wrong? What's your improvement over time? Um, and then also being able to input your own question. So right now it's relatively easy. Mm -hmm. So it's just, like, single digit, you know, what's 7 plus 9. Um, but as, you know... As kids get older, you can start putting in more complex questions, um, maybe start doing like double digit addition or things like that. So we don't have that um, right now, but I think we're going to have it later. We'll have it oh, where kids idea. can put it in, and then the game will just auto generate like the, you know, other wrong answers and then the correct answers. And then the parents don't have to like, you know, put in the answers for it because it's so easy to kind of type in the wrong thing <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> and I, you so, know what that's a great idea though my daughter plays prodigy and i get these report cards from the game in my email and then i can send her gifts through it so i don't know if you've ever seen that but i think wow. that's probably a really good way to go with tortuga racing um that's that it probably makes more sense. You probably get way more mileage out of that than the spectator camera, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. But um, no, I actually I think that's uh, that's very smart uh, to focus on sort of the the back end experience with the mm -hmm. connecting the parent and the child. That really makes sense with these educational games. Yeah, um, because you want to see how it, you know how well they're doing on it. So the the bit, so you know it's interesting because. We didn't go into, again, we didn't like go into the game development thing, being like, oh, we're going to make educational games, but it just kind of like turned out that mm -hmm, way, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, not all our games are going to be educational, <laughs> but it was just like the kind of the first two that we made kind of fell on that. And I think that's um, because uh, my VP is actually a teacher. Yes. Okay, <laughs> um, there you go. He, he well, he's a, he's a middle school music teacher. Um, I, my parents were actually also educators, so... Um, they had a, I don't know if you've heard of Kumon Math and Reading Center. So I think I have heard of that. Yeah, it's basically like a, um, it's not a tutoring center. It's more of like a secondary educational thing kind of to help build up your basics and stuff like that. Um, it's more about individualized study than being tutored by someone essentially. So um, they ran that since I was, I don't know, I want to say like in second or third grade. Right. So I think that definitely kind of colors, you know, what we do as well. Um, so a lot of uh, Tortuga racing, especially, I think I got a lot of it from Kumon, because Kumon math, which is basically just drilling, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, all right, here are these worksheets, complete the worksheets, um, and then you'd have to repeat, the, you know, certain worksheets uh, X amount of times if you got too many mistakes or if it took you too long. And then as you kept repeating it, you would, you know, remember what the things were and you would get faster and stuff like that. So it's kind of, you know, kind of used that for the Tortuga racing base, which I think helps. Um, if as well as if it works, like, you know, and it does work. Yeah, so. which it does work. I mean, you know, I definitely, especially for the simpler stuff, I definitely think there's something to um, drilling um, the questions and things like that, mm -hmm. just so that you know it and can do it quickly. Um, once you get into more complicated things, definitely probably not drilling is not the best idea. Um, you kind of have to understand the concepts and everything like that. But for simple addition and multiplication, division and um, subtraction, I think that definitely helps. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to give Tortuga Racing to my daughter. I tried to show it to her the other day and... For whatever reason, it was not a good time to show her a game. But yeah. after I played, it was like, I'm giving this to my, my eight-year-old. She's going to be playing this game. 
uh, for sure. And she's, you know, she played prodigies helped and I'm always looking for things to give her. I love, I love the fast paced nature of it. Like I said, it takes me back fifth grade. I had a buddy. And so we would do those sheets with the hundred like multiplication Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you, you, we would race, and I was gonna say my wife actually. She and I talked because she loved those too. We didn't go to school, you know, elementary school together, but um, that, that was always a good time racing. I think my buddy yeah. used to beat me all the time. Unfortunately, <laughs> most, most of the time, I think he would win. But uh, yeah, just like a second or, or whatever. Yeah, but it was, yeah. he would always burn me. <laughs> we, we had a uh, in our school. We had something called around the world, mm-hmm. um, where you would have one person, and then they would go to each per, you know, whoever was at the desk, and then. The teacher would flash the flash card, and then whoever answers would go next. And then if you were able to get through the whole thing, um, then you would get a prize. Oh, so yeah, that's cool. At, at some point, they told me I couldn't play anymore. <laughs> oh, no. They're like, no, everybody but you. You can't, like, oh, come on. Oh, you win too much. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, All I do is win, win, win. They're like, you can't do it anymore. I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> Maybe the rest of the kids need to just get good. So those drills, <laughs> they worked. Those drills, your parents were drilling you all the time. Exactly. Answer these math problems. That's funny. Um, now, jumping to the Painter's Apprentice, I guess, and that's where I, I did pick up on this, because you're learning also about these, all of these artists. And it's it's interesting when you go back and study art history a little bit, how, you know, people at first were... I guess concerned with trying to capture realism Mm -hmm. and then eventually they broke all they you know everything just got so realistic the shadowing everything was was so perfect and eventually they got into all the abstract stuff and I I remember um, going you know I went to Italy and going around all these you know all the churches and things and you can see like the Caravaggio's and and just all these different paintings Um, and then coming up on the abstract stuff and I was like this is like video games you know we, we we had this period of time where everybody you know the tools and everything weren't really there to make everything look photorealistic mm-hmm. but eventually we kind of got there and now there's memes on social media like crisis 2007 and where are we in 2017 Fortnite. you know they yeah. <laughs> like you would have thought we would keep going but basically We're stylized yeah everybody that we hit crisis and or you know whatever that you know and call of duty and modern warfare at the time we sort of hit that level and then everybody broke off and started doing more abstract stuff. It's kind of interesting how the I felt like the art forms sort of mirrored each other a little bit. There was a uh, you know this this great like drive to make something perfectly photorealistic, and then like well it's already been done, and we're not going to go any further in that direction. So like let's break off and just do all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean I think it depends. So I think a lot of you know. Um when you look at something like realism or uh, it was kind of to portray, you know, here's the lifestyle of what's going on. Um, but also I think a lot of it has to do with who was commissioning it. Cause a lot of art in the early days were commissioned pieces, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so somebody was paying these people to make something and in, in the style that they wanted. Um, so I feel like you're kind you were kind of limited in that aspect, especially for artists who had to deal with getting commissions and patrons and stuff like that. You wanted to stay within the norms of that time and the styles of that time. So you didn't have as much ability to kind of branch off into something else. Whereas later on, you know, as you kind of get towards more modern times, you do have that ability, you know, it's more about, uh, galleries and I mean you still have people who are commissioning you and you still have things like that but now there's a bit more freedom to do, kind of do what you want so you can kind of get these crazy abstract things with cubism or surrealism or whatever to be a bit more like I guess uh, metaphorical in a sense right um, and I feel like the same, you know, games are a little different, obviously, but initially it was more, you know, large companies or the actual manufacturers, you know, Nintendo, Sega, Sony, <laughs> um, they were the ones who were creating the games. And then you had like Rare and those other guys, um, like actual in- game developers. Mm-hmm. But, you know, once I, I honestly feel like once it started opening up with the release of things like Unity and game engines and it made it a lot more accessible then you could really start getting a lot more creative with the games and then obviously indie developers don't necessarily have the money (laughs) to make photorealistic stuff so in order to make a good game 
um, you still want to have something that's uh, visually appealing, but you don't necessarily, you know, now you can get away with like, all right, we want to make a good gameplay that's visually appealing, but we don't necessarily have to make it photorealistic. Um, and I think there's a lot of games that have proven that, like Mario is still super popular. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, so I think it's just something that opening it up to smaller developers has kind of taken it in that direction where, yeah, we have a lot more variety in terms of what's coming out. It's interesting the um, that that sort of take because the opening up of the industry is that you know did that occur because you had too many people competing along sort of the same vector like oh we're gonna make the biggest baddest most photorealistic game and we're gonna put twenty a hundred million dollars into it or whatever eventually of course that space gets crowded and you know people are losing their jobs or whatever and then you have all these people with the skill set now and I've got this philosophy life is a vector so I almost look at everything as if it's a vector and, and so I, I see this like overarching industry vector you know uh, uh, that th- that time period that ended let's say it ended in 2007 or like 2010 or whatever somewhere somewhere around then um, I would say 2007 because it was really when the iPhone came around that we saw a really big indie boom I mean we the yeah. indie market was just was really starting to like bubble up starting in like 1999 early 2000s but it still it wasn't cool yet Mm -hmm. but once the iPhone came around that's what made it cool but yeah you're absolutely right of course you had these indies they had access to tools they had access to distribution channels they never had before and they didn't have the budgets to make those big games but part of the reason that all those things opened up was because there was so much competition uh, you know to make that big budget game and not everybody could fit into that space so it sort of exploded out and yeah, and then once you're an indie, uh, I feel like the value that an indie brings to the table is that they compete on direction, sort of the direction of their creativity versus the magnitude of their execution. Uh-huh. And you know, when we play a you know big Sony game or like the latest Electronic Arts or game or something, we're expecting this phenomenal you know degree of magnitude uh-huh. um, from the game. But when we play an indie game, what we look for is the the creativity of the direction they chose to approach the game. And so it's two different ways of of judging it, and it gives. The neat thing about it is, of course, there's an infinite number of directions that you can take, and that's why we get these games sort of out of left field where we yeah, it's like, what the heck? Where did Untitled Goose Untitled Game come from? What the heck, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have that, what was that? There was like, um, oh my God, what was it? Hatful Boyfriend, like really <laughs> Goat Simulator. Yes, oh my God, that was a big hit too. <laughs> Like things you wouldn't really have gotten, right, if the industry had stayed closed off. And for better or for worse, you know, it's not necessarily like um, those games are masterpieces, um, but they fulfilled kind of this niche. And I think a lot of it was just so new and they took like such a unique direction or they were charming, you know, like I feel like most of, I never played it. Uh, Untitled Goose Game, so I can't really speak to it. But everything I've seen from the screenshots and stuff like that is just, uh, you know, it has a certain aesthetic quality that people really enjoy. Um, so I think there's a lot of different directions that um, people can take. Like Gone Home, you know, start mm-hmm. kind. Of, I think there were always like walking simulators per se, but I feel like that's what made it popular. Right. Um, and for a while, you had a lot of walking simulators that were happening until it became like, again, like a meme. And now you have like, you know. <laughs> Death Stranding, uh, yeah. which people are saying is basically a walking simulator. Pretty, pretty so, much, yeah. I was yeah. not sure what to expect from that game up, and then I saw it, and I was like, really? <laughs> okay. So, you know, and I think that I think that's actually good, where you can, you know, in a way, and I, know, I would say in a lot of um, forms of create art or anything creative, the indies are necessarily the ones who can take those risks and make these games start these new genres because they're you know they don't have to worry about investors breathing down their necks about you know what is your you know report on how much did you make this quarter and all of this stuff there's no nobody necessarily have to report to besides your company and yourself obviously um but you don't have that additional pressure where you have to like focus on the sales whereas that's what the AAA studios do have to focus on so you know they kind of go with tried and true stuff and then as more things become popular within the indie developer sphere sphere, then I feel like the AAA kind of takes that and kind of makes a more polished version of it 
to then bring to the general public? We we had at Pixel Fest 2018 uh, the producer on Fortnite, Grant Schonkweiler. I imagine one of the producers uh, is what I would imagine, but he said, you know, he spoke to that several times in his talk where he was like, yeah, the Indians will go off and they'll make something creative and then we'll steal it and we'll make exactly. it better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's sad, it's I guess, but I guess, but true. Um, yeah. Kind of I a mean, bummer. I think that, you know, you want to, because the whole thing is you want to make sure that this kind of style or gameplay or mechanic will be successful. Fortnite is hugely successful. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it makes sense, you know, they probably got it from other indie games where it's like, all right, well, it's obvious that stylized stuff is in vogue now. People like these battleground type games, um, like battle royale type games. So let's make one and we have the resources to do so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, it's an interesting Fortnite's a very um, interesting case. I mean, I'm sure case. it's the same with music or movies or anything like that, too. Absolutely. I mean, it's when these creative industries, people are, you know, working off of, building off of ideas, you know, adding, you know, adding this to it, taking that away and coming up with something different. Fortnite, I think, originally started out really trying to be like a Minecraft shooter. And, you know, because yeah. it has that whole crafting element, which almost, I, I don't know how much people talk about the crafting element anymore. But I think originally it was sort of running and gunning for like a Minecraft shooter type thing. Um, cause it started so long ago and I don't, I don't really know the full story. I know PUBG came out and so I, right. I'm not sure yeah. if Fortnite said, Hey, cool. We like that battle Royale mechanic from PUBG. Let's throw that into Fortnite. Cause Fortnite was basically just like forever in a, in a beta or alpha or I forgot what they said, early access. It was in early, it's still early access or something like that. So it's just like this continual live game that just, they've just updated and it seems like they would take the best elements that they thought they could from whatever popular game was at the time and continue to just, you know, change the game. And yeah, the art style, I imagine maybe Overwatch had some influence over that. I'm not positive about that either, but I could, um, you know, I could certainly see that. I mean, because obviously the art style doesn't match PUBG, just the, the setup of the Battle Royale does. You've got that crafting element, which is a very Minecrafty type thing to do. Um, and, you know, obviously they've they've been tremendously successful by mixing all these genres together and, and keeping the game just like live updated constantly, um, yeah. which I think is incredible. But Yeah, and I think this is, um, you know, there's been in the past, I want to say like a couple years, there's been now this um, move towards uh, multiplayer games, right? Mm -hmm. So a huge focus on multiplayer games. I think there was like, I forget which company it was, but basically like, oh, we're probably not going to make too many single player games anymore because the money is in multiplayer. Yep. So yeah, and I'm sure the pendulum will swing back the other way because now a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to deal with, mul you know, I just want a story. <laughs> I, want, yep. I want a single player thing. So, uh, you know, it's always this, you go one way, you go the other. There's always going to be changes in it. So it's really, you know, I think with, you kind of got to go with what you want to make. Yep. Um, especially like as an indie developer, it's, you know, I enjoy single player games personally. So I tend to I, make single player games. Um, I can like see that. Our, yeah. Our upcoming game, Osunia, we're, we're going to have a multiplayer aspect to it. More of like, uh, if you've played like Stardew Valley or anything like that, mm -hmm. so more of like a co-op kind of thing. Right. Um, so people can help on the farms or anything. It's not necessarily going to be become like an MMO, or you're not going to be able to visit like uh, other people's farms or anything like that. With like what you do in The Sims or Pocket Camp, it'll just be you know relatively contained. Will it be local um, multiplayer or online multiplayer? It'll be online multiplayer. Oh, nice. Yeah, I do love the aesthetic of that game because it has it does have a sort of Minecrafty element to it, but it really the backgrounds and such look like flat flat shaded polys. I'm Sorry, I didn't include a screenshot of that in the background for the show, but um, if I remember correctly, yeah, you've got like these rolling hills and stuff, but they're like flat shaded, like looking like virtual racing style yeah. polygons, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we're going with a low poly look. We're actually going to be updating it a little bit because we kind of changed what our human model looked like. Okay. The human, human model doesn't look great as low poly. Uh -huh. um, so we kind of wanted something that looks you know, nice and appealing. Um, so we might end up changing the way the background looks a little bit, but really I kind of like the colors that we have. Mm -hmm. you're, on a, you're on another planet, so we didn't want anything that was, like, too crazy. Um, but 
have like the green grass, we might change that more towards like a teal, kind of like a purpley ground color. We have some trees in there. Um, we have some unique creatures. You'll obviously have crops, and then we're going to add some other elements. Um, so there'll be crafting and cooking and like all the normal stuff that you can do in these types of games. Right. Um, but we're, we're also going to um, include uh, a little bit of like genetic engineering. Um, so I, I don't know how like how deep I want to get into it, but right now the idea is essentially like um, you don't start off with crops um, from Earth. So if you want to, like, let's say, make a pumpkin or something, you will collect samples of different uh, plants around the planet and then provide it to the research center, and then they will create the packets for you. And then later on, you'll be able to, like, extract seeds and stuff. Um, and then the same will be for, like, if you want cows or chickens or things like that. Um, you'll also be able to choose if, you know, you can choose to grow, like, earth plants or you can choose to grow native plants. Um, and then, you know, I'm like, all right, well, maybe we could add, like, some mutations to these things. <laughs> maybe not too crazy. We kind of, I don't want to make the game too dark, you know. Right. But, like, you know, if you have a regular cow, maybe, like, there's some mutation you can have and then you get like a chocolate cow and you nice. get like chocolate milk or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was like, know? that could go either way, but I like yeah. I like the direction you're taking that in. That's very that would be fun to, to yeah. add a little bit of that into it. A little bit of humor. Exactly. Delicious so, chocolate you know, milk is always good. Like, you can do things like that. And I think, you know, I was talking to some other people, um, when we were showing the game off, they're like, Oh, you could have stuff like, you know, um, what is it called? Uh, invasive species with your plants oh. and things like that. Like, I don't know, maybe that could be interesting. You'd have some like conflict, know. a little bit of conflict might be yeah. okay, depending on how, depending on the magnitude that you take that conflict. Exactly. Do you remember the chocolate milk cow commercial, like the chocolate cow, <laughs> yeah, like I do. from back with the chocolate <laughs> river and all that? I showed my daughter that recently. Yeah. Oh, I love that commercial. So you just got, that like, I just great. got a flashback of that um, in my head when you were saying, do, like, yeah. strawberry milk. Yep. <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of options you can have. <laughs> that is going to be so much fun. Well, yeah, so, if the, uh, if the backgrounds. Uh, I'm excited for that. We, we're working, we've been working on it for, I want to say about two years now. Wow. Okay. Um, and I'm really hoping, is that you or is that me? I'm hearing like beeping. Um, I, I don't hear it. <laughs> oh, is this me? I don't know why I'd be beeping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, anyway, so I've been working on um, we've been working on the game for about two years, um, hoping that by the fall we can have like a really nice um, demo that has pretty much everything that we need. So we've got fishing, and we're working on fishing now. We've got quests in there. Um, hopefully, we can like get everything else in there. Um, and then we're also working on a couple other games. So these are smaller games. Um, and these are not educational at all. These are just like really like uh, super. One's a super casual game. Okay. Uh, called Neko Attack. So it's basically mm. like a game where you um, catch things falling from the sky. Okay. Um, and the other one is a visual novel. So it's super short. It's a very short visual novel, uh, but it has I want to say sixteen different endings. Oh, nice. Um, and it's called One uh, Eight Hundred Love You. So essentially. Um, you play as the uh, avatar of a phone, and you're trying to get the attention of uh, <laughs> the guy who owns your who owns the phone. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very intriguing. That's gonna be that's gonna be interesting. Um, is there like a sort of backwards? I'm trying to think. You know, people are so obsessed with their phones right now. I feel like so. Is there? Is it a commentary on that? Um, not really. I just thought it was a really cute idea. Okay. <laughs> um, so most of my game ideas, um, generally are like, oh, that seems fun. Let's make it. Right. Um, there's not necessarily too much, like, uh, thought going up there, <laughs> um, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I actually, when I started making this, I was thinking, oh, you know, it would be another fun idea. Um, and this would be, like, because people are, you know, kind of on their phone a lot um so I, I don't know what the name of it would be but essentially it would be like uh you know your pocket girlfriend or boyfriend um and it, depending on certain questions that you answer 
and the way you interact with so kind of like a tama, tamagotchi right yes how yes. you interact with it will develop the personality of your boyfriend or girlfriend okay so they might be like very sweet or they might be kind of like a ice queen or they <laughs> might you know if you, they might be a yandere <laughs> or something <laughs> like that so um yeah so i was like thinking like oh the, the first one that came to my mind was a yandere i was like oh it'd be like hilarious if it could just be like you know, it wouldn't permanently do anything, but it would like, you know, if you're, you know, let's say you're, you call your wife a lot and you have this game, they'd be like, who is this person you're calling on the time? And then they'd show you a <laughs> screenshot having deleted the num all the numbers in your contact, <laughs> <laughs> replacing all of the, you know, pictures of you and your wife and putting her face on the picture of your wife, yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> once we, yeah, once we have phones that are like full born AIs, are they yeah. going to get jealous of our real life connections? Yeah. <laughs> So I was like, that could be really fun. That uh, is, that sounds entertaining. <laughs> oh, man. This is really good stuff. You guys have, uh, I think, a lot of creativity in your studio. It looks like you guys have a lot of talent. Um, you know, obviously the art is is top-notch in these games. And, what, and um, do you, now, do you do some of the engineering? Or are you primarily doing design? And, and um, how, how many people on the team will actually get in and, and do the engineering on these games? So I do mostly the level design okay. and the game design aspect of it. Um, I also, you know, obviously do the project lead and stuff like that. So project management stuff. Um, but we have, so depending on um, the game. So we used to use Unity and we would have maybe like two uh, programmers, two, three programmers working right. on it. So, you know, we'd have like a general gameplay programmer, we would have AI programmer, and then we would have someone to just kind of help out with bugs or something like that, more of like a junior programmer. Right. Um, and then now we're working in Unreal, okay. which has been uh, a huge change. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have, uh, we have programmers as well so it's kind of it's kind of broken down the same we have somebody working on like bugs and small features we have another one working on gameplay uh, mechanics and we have another one working on um, AI now what um what caused you guys to give Unreal a shot um mainly since this was a 3d game mm -hmm. um we're kind of like you know we've been hearing a lot about Unreal um, heard it was really good for 3D. The baked-in lighting is great. Like we really didn't have to do too much in terms of like changing the lighting or anything like that when right. we actually just put it in there. Um, it also has a lot better multiplayer support than Unity does, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which was like the really big deciding factor for us since we wanted to do multiplayer. We wanted something that would be super easy to implement. Right. Um, and there are some things for Unity, but they're not well documented like they have, they have plugins and stuff but they're not like well documented and they're a little bit confusing so unreal was a lot easier um with that said uh it's been you know very different working with it <laughs> um, yeah do you guys dive into the c plus plus side of you of uh, unreal a lot or you work mainly with the blueprints so it's a combination of c plus plus and blueprints right um, it's mainly blueprints, but C++ is more for like the static objects and things like that. Right. Um, so, you know, if we want to do, we want to have like the base for you know, a plant or something, and then we go into C++ and then we go into the blueprints and then we add in like, you know, here's the plant that we want to use and, you know, here's the num you know, the numbers of which we, you know, what will it look like when it wilts and here's the growth cycle and all that stuff. Right. So yeah, you've got to put those hooks in. Now it's interesting, you know. I've, um, one of our local developers, Andrew Scott Hollis, is uh, he's a big fan of Unreal. Mm -hmm. I've been using Unity for so many years now, and it's almost impossible for me to think about using anything else. <laughs> um, and on the multiplayer side, yeah, Unity can't get something in house together yeah, that is very good. Now, which is, we use Photon. I'm sure so. they will. I'm sure they will. Photon like is very nice. But yeah, they're looking for something that's a little bit more plug and play for people, so that they don't really have to be, you know, network programmers necessarily yeah. to get some a multiplayer experience up and running. I don't know where they are at with that. Um, you know, currently I know that the person who was working on their previous multiplayer left the company for one reason or another. I'm not really sure why, and he was 
you know, sort of like midway, I don't want to say midway through development. I mean, the the system that they had in Unity 2017, I think it was, or I'm trying to think of 17. I'm trying to think of the last version of Unity that it was in there. I mean, it wasn't terrible. It, it had some actually really neat features. Uh, I think something like Photon uh, for multiplayer is probably your your best bet. And of course, Photon's like, you know, it's not even just Unity. It's, you know, if you're just working in straight C++ or something like that, you can use Photon. They've got support for like all over the place, which is, and um, it's pretty robust, but that's, it's interesting. I'm gonna have to, I keep saying this, I'm like, I'm gonna have to dive into Unreal uh, at some point. You know, I know all about it, I've read all about it, uh, but yeah, I'm such a Unity, I'm just such a Unity dude. It's hard for me yeah. to, it's hard I mean, to it's think hard about switching to another. Switch what was that? And I, think, I said it's hard to switch over. And yeah. I think Unity has, it, it's a lot easier um, in terms of seeing what is working. Right. And kind of, if you're more of like a, and I've learned, I thought I was a visual, like a visual person, but then I got into blueprints. I'm like, I have no idea what any of this means. Right. Why is this connecting to this thing? Um, whereas when you go into Unity, you just have the code, you can look at the place where you're going, you're like, oh, here, okay, I know what this is doing because it yeah. literally just says here, this is what this is working on. And I think working with code is ultimately faster. Yes. I'm um, not a big fan of visual stuff either yeah. I mean even I don't even like uh, if I'm going to look stuff up and there's a tutorial that I need to follow I'm I'm not a big fan of videos a lot of people yeah. are like videos and I'm like no give me the page I'm gonna scroll through the page as fast as I can find the thing that I'm looking for you know zero in on it and I don't know if that's just a matter of me you know having done this for so long that I kind of know what I want already but having to scrub yeah. through a video is like that's painful for me I'm not gonna do that well, yeah I mean it video can be good when you're first starting off so mm -hmm. you can kind of see and then there's like the explanation this is why I'm doing this and this is why this but like when you already are familiar with what you need to do you can yeah you can just like all right you know I need to do this and then in unity why isn't this working kind of thing yep. I mean that's not what you would type in obviously yeah. but um yeah you can find it really easily and unity has a very so one thing I really like about unity is that it has a very robust um, documentation. Like, oh, the docs really, are incredible. Really good. And then the forums are amazing too. So you yeah. can pretty much find, if it's not covered in the documentation, you can usually find it in the forums. I, Unreal, not so much. Okay. <laughs> How are the docs with Unreal? Because I think I was they having a discussion. Okay. I've been working on a lot of documentation. And I was telling somebody, I'm like, I think half the reason Unity has been so successful is because their documentation is incredible. It really is. It really is. It, it's okay. It's not horrible, but it could be better. Right. Um, it's hard to find things, I find. And, like, sometimes when I look something up, it just gives me the definition and not, like, you know, anything else. I'm like, all right, well, this doesn't really help <laughs> yeah. me. Like, how do I actually use it within the thing? And then they have a video. They, I think they tend to focus on more of a video series. Okay. Um, so there's that. Too. Which slows you down. That's slowing you down. Yeah, you need to listen. Really give me does. the give me the definition. Give me the the members. Give me the, an yeah. example, a code example that I can copy and paste exactly. and go see what it does. Yeah. Oh exactly. man. So yeah, it's 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 a lot harder personally um, to work with it. I think. So I'm sure other people like I know other people who are like they pick it up and they they can jam out on it almost right. immediately after. But it's been. Because um, I'm also, you know, teaching myself Unreal too. So, you know, with Unity, I, I'm not a programmer, but I can, I've learned enough where I can go through and make changes and like update things and see where the issues are. But right. with like Unreal, it's a lot harder because it's hidden in C++, but then it's also in the blueprint. So you have to kind of, you kind of have to dig around and kind of look through all of the references. Right. And, oh, is it in the blueprints or is it in the C++ that's making it and like all of this stuff. So. Very, very, very cool. I'm, I'm sure still that's not encouraging you to. Switch I'm now. I'm still. You know what? <laughs> I'm still intrigued at some point to dive in and give it a give it another look. I have looked at it like, but it was way in the past. I mean, I think I'm trying think to remember the last time I looked at Unreal was a long time. I I haven't. Um, what caused me to jump over to Unity was that I had been working with Garage Games and I had gone out to IGC 2007. I'd already, you know, I'd already used Unity before that. I'm trying to think what year. I've, I've been using Unity for almost 15 years. But I came back and I decided after that conference, and Garage Games was, was going to be sold. So they announced they're going to be sold. And, um, you know, things were changing at the company. And I decided, you know what, I, I'm going to give Unity a real shot. You know, I'd already checked it out, but I hadn't made, like, the full jump over. 
And I had a game that I was prototyping also. So I prototyped it in Torque 2D. I prototyped it in an engine called Shiva, which might still be around. And I prototyped it in Unity. And um, this particular game, it was a building demolition game. I actually think I invented this genre. It was the first one on iPhone that I knew about. Somebody came behind me like two months after me and did like a really good one though, and that one shot yeah. to the top of the charts. <laughs> Mine sucked, but it was the first one. Um, anyway, I needed the physics engine to be deterministic in order to make the gameplay work, you know, because you had to put the bombs on the building and then hit the plunger, right. and you wanted the building to blow up the same way every time if you put the bombs in the same place, you know. Right. So um, the Torque 2D engine was not anywhere close to deterministic. Um, neither was Shiva, and I liked Unity, I think, better overall than those other two engines anyway, but ultimately I had to go with it because the physics were almost deterministic. So it was like 90%, like 18 out of 20 times that you place those bombs on the building, it would blow up the identical way, which yeah. I felt was good enough to yeah, um, right. <laughs> to go with. So yeah, I made the game with that, and, and then uh, you know I just had been using Unity like ever since, and I've, I told um, David Helgeson, man, I, I actually told him, I was like, this this engine just makes me feel like a superhero. I don't know how to describe it, but like, <laughs> it just makes so much sense to me. And I, I know it doesn't make that much sense to everybody, but for whatever reason, it has the right combination of, like you said, being able to access the code, but it's got, you know, a visual side to it as well, where you can manipulate things, you know, in inside of the scene view, you can dive into the hierarchy. It's got, you know, you've got the, the inspector, I don't know really what to say other than it's just got this nice mix between sort of your analytical brain and your artist brain is kind of yeah. the way that I feel about it. So Yeah, I mean I think having I mean, having kind of worked with both, I think Unity is easier mm -hmm. for me to grasp. <laughs> um, Unreal, you know, I haven't really dealt like I haven't delved into the full suite of everything Unreal, but, right. you know, what everybody says is that Unreal just has better graphics, better lighting, shading, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure most people, if they didn't see Made in Unity before a game, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between what was Made in Unity yeah, and Unreal. Yeah, no, not many people um, would be able to anyway. I'm, yeah, I've also actually started looking into Gata Engine. Yes, a lot um, of people have been, a lot of indies have been talking about that. Yeah. And it's um, it's actually been pretty fun. Like it's definitely different, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's the language is pretty simple. So I think it's based off of Python. GDScript is based off of Python. Right. Um, so and, and you know, I think it's also just like you can. There is a visual script for it. Um, so if you want to do like the visual thing, like the visual scripting, you can. Um, and obviously, you can also do regular coding and things like that. So I like that they have both options. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to be a lot quicker to script than it is to do the visual aspect. But I yeah. think visual aspect is actually, you know, I think you still need to know some coding for it to mm -hmm. understand, like, why are you using these, um, you know, connections or things like this. Um, but if you do know that, it can be just like a, you know, you know the basics, but you don't know exactly how to type everything out, I guess. Um, you can just easily plug things in there. And I feel like it's actually, for me, more intuitive than Unreal's blueprints. Their, their, script, their, their visual scripting. Yeah. Now, do you know what's really interesting? I read a headline this past week or so that Unreal invested in Godot. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I wonder if they're going to buy it out. Yeah, so Actually, um, well, Godot is an uh, open source, so I don't think you can't like really buy it out. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the what the article was, but everybody was a lot of people were speculating that they were going to try to eat into Unity's low end, you know, because Unity's sort of eating into Unreal's high end side of the market, you know, as as time goes on. Yeah. And so the speculation was, oh, are they going to try to eat into Unity's low end? Because you know, Unity's base is all the indie developers. That's really the right. the roots of of Unity. And as you know, time has marched on. I mean, Unity is now a six billion dollar company. I think I think yeah. it's, the company's worth more than on, than Epic, um, if I'm not mistaken. And they've got I mean, Unity now has two thousand engineers that work on it. So it's you know it's a it's it's a huge company at this point. Yeah, um, I mean they they were pretty smart. Like oh yeah, they you know had the free version so anybody could make a game, and then <laughs> their uh, 
their business stuff wasn't, I mean, it was kind of expensive, but it wasn't like super expensive. Mm -hmm. um, now you have the script subscription models and things, which I know a lot of people were belly aching about when they first came out with it, but you can see there's still the free version. <laughs> yeah, no, you can get in for free and um, I pay, I just have like the uh, $35 a month subscription at the, right now and it's great. I mean, I don't have to put a splash screen on there and yeah. I can make whatever. So that's that always seems like a good deal. I used to have the pro version of the engine for a number of years. The first version of the engine I ever got, um, David Helgeson gave that to me. But then I came a couple years, a year or two later, I bought a full license to it. And then I kept that pro license going for a number of years. So yeah. I spent, I don't know how many thousands of dollars yeah, on we'll the pro see. license. We'll see what happens. I'm sure there will be other game engines that pop up. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it is going to be interesting. I, a lot of the people that I spoke to that were using Godot awesome. yeah. were saying that... Um, but yeah, so I think I'm going to be making the little Neko attack game on Godot, and then I'm thinking oh. for the visual novel I would use Renpai. Oh, neat. Yeah, a lot of, well, a lot of indies thought that Unity was becoming, uh, you know, sort of too big, and so I think people were looking for another you know, less centralized tool, I guess, something smaller, again, to, mm -hmm. to jump into. And that was sort of the vibe that I was getting. We, you know, I talked to a number of developers using it at various, like, global game jam sites and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's just, you know, it's sort of ramping up. So that's neat. And um, what was the other engine you mentioned? There was another one I mentioned. Rent, rent, what did you say? Oh, RenPy, RenPy. Yeah. So RenPy is basically a visual novel creator. Okay. Um, and it uses Python as its base base language but so it's what a lot of visual novels are made in so it's like super simple you you know load in your assets and then you can essentially just you know say so when this asset enters in here play background music here's where each it's almost like um what is that called uh i can't remember it for the life of me but there's another visual novel text novel thing that's online whose name escapes me but it's kind of like that where you kind of like put in the text and then you, you huh. link something to something else I forget what the name of it was but yeah so it's pretty simple you don't need like that sounds fun programming <laughs> knowledge. Yeah. yeah so I don't did you ever play Doki Doki Literature Club I did not no so um so that game actually was made in Renpai so it actually I mean I don't, I don't, I do, I mean, I won't give it away, but in case people are watching this, like, oh, I really wanted to play the game and she spoiled it. Right. But essentially, um, it, it, it does a lot. So instead of like your typical visual novel, it do, there's like a lot of functionalities that the developers um, put in there and they really push the engine um, quite a bit in a very interesting way. So, you know, just because it's like pretty basic um, doesn't necessarily mean. Um, limited functionality. Yeah, that sounds like um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check that out. That sounds like something that would be fun for putting your you know your stories together. If you uh -huh. if you want if yeah. you're more interested in developing narrative than necessarily complex gameplay or whatever, sounds like yeah. that could be a lot of Absolutely. fun. So that's very 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 cool. Yeah, and I mean there's a lot of different engines out there. Um, there's you know stencil. There's Game Salad. I mean, Game Maker is another mm -hmm. big one, obviously. I know so many um, people a, love Game Maker. Yeah, there's um, RPG Maker. They have like uh, dozens of editions. That's still going, like, huh? <laughs> that's yeah. That's been going for they, a long time. They have so many different editions. I'm like, I don't know which one that I should be using because there's like they release so many in the same year. I'm like, I, I'm not even gonna <laughs> buy anything. <laughs> I don't know which one to use. <laughs> um, there's also what is it called? There's another one that a lot of people are using using Ghost 2D um, that a lot of people that Ghost I've heard 2D. a lot of like okay. Cocos yeah I've heard a lot of oh. people are using that as well right uh, Cocos 2D right hmm? did you say Cocos 2D yeah Cocos 2D okay for some reason I thought you said Ghost 2D and I was like huh that's a cool name for an engine <laughs> <laughs> very sweet so we are creeping up here on about an hour and it has been great to chatting with you Jasmine do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share uh, this evening with our guest um, not really I mean I guess the main thing is like since you know we'll, we'll impart some 
wisdom. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I love a developer really, lesson. Do you have a developer really lesson to share? That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the main thing is for you know, just kind of go into it, learning. Um, game development can be can potentially take a lot of time. It can also not potentially take a lot of time. So, you know, depending when you're starting a game, I think the most important thing to do is manage your scope, something that I'm still trying to learn how to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think that people who want to jump into it, um, you know, if you don't have a programming background or anything, I think like I mentioned, like a couple other, uh, engines but try game maker try stencil try game salad all of these are drag and drop interfaces so you don't actually need to know any coding um if you do have coding experience use like unity or unreal if you like um but yeah and i think really just kind of have fun make games that you want to play um and you know if it sells it sells if it doesn't it doesn't but just kind of enjoy the process of it Right on. And you're now you're in your team. Were were you all friends that just decided to make games together, or was it you wanted to make a game and you you know started pulling people together to do it? I mean, how you got a nice team together? How did that come yeah. together? So uh, the co-founder and I we actually worked on the previous studio, Salty Pepper. Um, so when that shuttered, we were like, all right, well, we have the IPs for this game. So we should start our own company. Um, we so we did, <laughs> um, and then we kind of you know found people along the way. So we I reached out to people through Deviant Art for artists. Um, I kind of scoured the Unity forums and Unreal forums and Reddit and what it, wherever else for programmers. And then there were some people who got referred to me by previous um, friends or previous people who had worked with me. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag. We, we didn't really know each other before. I still haven't actually even uh, met my VP face to face. He's in Texas. <laughs> So <laughs> I've actually met two of my artists, um, but everybody else on the team I actually have not met. So you, a lot of you guys are virtual. Well, that that's the story yeah, all, of today's world, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, it's effective. Yeah. Um, really, most of the stuff you don't you don't necessarily need an office for. You have your Trello boards for project management. We have Discord to kind of keep up to date. We have weekly meetings. Um, kind of like a weekly, I mean, it's not the correct uh, definition of scrum, since scrums are every day, but like a weekly scrum. Right. Um, and then, yeah, we just kind of keep in touch throughout the rest of the week, um, just making sure that we're going the right direction and answering any questions that they might have and things like that. Well, very, very cool. Thank you so much for being on the Pixelcast this week. The studio is Luminosity. The founder is Jasmine Green. The games are The Painter's Apprentice, Tortuga Racing, and Osunia? Yes. Which is coming soon, which sounds very cool. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> and, um, you know, and of, of course, and I think Jasmine uh, has done this through, through her games, but, encouraging yeah, we'll, us we'll to see. all continue when growing, right? All continue growing through love of games. And I think you've done a great job with your games of doing that, which is very cool. So. And I, uh, with that, though, I want to bid everyone a good evening. And Jasmine, any last words before we head out? Um, no, I think, uh, yeah, just like have fun out there and then check out my games. <laughs> awesome. You can get Tortuga Racing on the App Store or Android, and you can get The Painter's Apprentice right now on Steam. So, yes, yes everybody, love it. Let's all continue growing through love of games and have a great night.